Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Conversations with Coaches podcast. I'm your host, Kevin, and I am absolutely delighted to have another returning guest, one of my favorite guests, one of my first guests. We were we were chatting before I hit record that it's been nearly two years since we last talked, which seems both like yesterday and an eternity somehow. But, you know, time, what are you going to do? Anyway, I have Tom Henschel back with me. And in case you've forgotten him, which could be understandable, I've talked to a lot of coaches since I last talked to Tom, but let me reacquaint you with Tom before we jump back into an already delightful conversation. Tom has been coaching senior corporate leaders for more than 30 years, helping to soften disruptive executives and amplify the look and sound of leadership, which just so happens to be the name of his podcast now in its 15th year, I believe. Yes. Decade and a half. Goodness. Goodness. I love it. He's a senior executive coach on the rosters of many coaching consortiums nationwide, being an active member of the International Coaching Federation, of course, the ICF, and the Association of Talent Development, which in 2010 awarded him with their lifetime award for continuing contributions to the fields of training and development. Tom, it is delightful to talk with you again. We chatted for about a good solid 10 minutes before I hit record, and yeah, I'm just delighted to chat with you again. I love how quickly we get to the good stuff. And it's just a delight to see your face again. It's good to see you. <laughs> Same here. I'm glad to be back. Thanks. So we we are already touched on probably a half dozen different podcast episodes worth of, of subjects. So I'm going to start by asking you about, about your 2023, what that's looked like, what that how it was planned to look, how it ended up looking. Um and also how that has reminded you, or at least how that brought up in our conversation, other times in your life and how your business has evolved over the years and decades. Yeah, so we, you and I are recording this in April of 2023. So mm -hmm. we finished January, February, and March. I worked in January. In February, I met my daughter and her husband in New Zealand for 30 days of an <laughs> amazing trip. And I flew back at the beginning of March and almost immediately went literally from the plane to an operating room and had some surgery and then had almost a month of recovery. So mm -hmm. out of the first quarter of 2023, I've only worked for one month. And <laughs> and that was bizarre. You know, that was just mm -hmm. weird. And <laughs> in 2022, I worked for 10 months intentionally and earned the same as 12 months the prior year. And I thought, mm. wouldn't I like to do that? I mean, wouldn't that be <laughs> great, right? To work for 10 months and earn 12 months worth. And like, that would be great. So mm -hmm. it, yeah, it, it, it's an interesting, different way for me to think about my business. I've never thought about my business that way. Hmm. You think about like, I mean, and you say it's your business. And it's one of those things where you really did, you, like you, you put in the work. And there's a lot of work to it. There's a lot of in, an investment that I work gets thrown around a lot. And I think appropriately, because you really are putting putting your time, your energy, like really your life's essence into building a business that's going to like, you know, grow your impact and connect you with other people in the world around you. And it's there's a lot of work to be had there. And I like ands instead of buts. I like buts just fine, but ands are better. And your business can, and maybe even should, if it's indeed what you want, evolve into something where, you know, I don't have to be here all the time if i go if i if i leave for five minutes the lights aren't going to shut down and everything's going to go away in a puff like you, your business can evolve to a place where things like you know i'm going to take some time or i'm going to i'm going to spend some time on some other pursuits or i'm going to spend some time with family that can and possibly should happen as your business grows well one of the things that i said to someone recently is like look i'm a coach my clients don't have emergencies <laughs> you know, they don't have yeah. to talk to me like on the 15th of the month. So <laughs> uh, to give myself permission last year, to give myself permission to work 10 months hmm. was a challenge. I've never, I've never taken 30 day vacation before, hmm. uh, before last year. Yeah. And when I did, and the world did not come to an end, <laughs> I thought maybe I could do this with intention. And so it was a real different reimagining of what was possible. And I'm mm. grateful. I'm grateful that I'm at a place, you know, in my business that it is self-sustaining. Mm. I think 10 years ago, I probably couldn't have taken a 30-day vacation and been okay at the end of the year on my, you know, profit and loss statement. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think you hit on another another I word that I think is, is incredibly important here, and that's intention. 
Like you took that time with intention. And by doing that, you were able to really understand what it was going to take. What, your, what does my business have to look like for it to run without me? Not entirely without you, like still your business, but what does this look like if I can step away for a little while and everything still runs smooth and at the end of the year, the books look the same as they've always looked or better. And that's, yeah. that's intention. Yeah. And listen, when I was raising my girls and, you know, working harder and my, you know, I wasn't as confident in my earnings that it was going to really be there at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. I was lucky to take, you know, a two week vacation once a year. Yeah. <laughs> so to take 30 days twice a year, you know, that's quite an evolution for me. And, you know, in many ways that my business will sustain it, but also that I can give myself permission to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There you go. That may, be, that may be the single hardest hurdle, obviously, intentionality and structuring your business in such a way that you can be, you're not, you're not at the central hub. You're not the, the hub with all the spokes kind of radiating out, out from you. There's that, but there's also the giving yourself permission. I'm so glad you mentioned that and brought that up because that's, so challenging for so many of the coaches I get to talk to. Um, and I imagine any entrepreneur or person who has started or run a, run a business where just you're constantly feeding into feeding yourself into the success of this business, the success of this endeavor. You're giving it your all because it matters to you. You care about it. You're passionate about it. Ideally, it's it's great. You love being this passionate about the things that you do. But that can that can interfere with or at least kind of like cause you to lose track of the fact that you give yourself permission to do these things and to kind of flip the polarity on that and give yourself the permission to step away as you've been giving yourself the permission to step into for so long over and over again. That's, I think that's something that we don't, well, I think we do. I, I don't know if we talk enough about that, that permission structure and how to, how to, how to interact with it as our business grows and evolves. And as we grow and evolve. Two quick thoughts. Number one is, yeah. My, my business is old enough now that I mm. could look ahead when I knew I was going to, for example, take my first 30 days off in 2022. Mm. And I knew what I had to do to, to make the business work while I was gone. Mm. So I have a team, you know, my podcast went on without me. I don't mean that really, but like I had prepped it. I preloaded it. Mm -hmm. so that, it, it that was one way of giving myself permission was I had to do all the work to get myself out of here. And that was good that I knew my business that well. Another thing, you know, I mentor a lot of other coaches. And one of the things that I'm aware of is coaches are really good at coaching. They're not always good at business. Mm. They're not always good at, you know, the things that freak them out around marketing or funnels or client management and all that kind of business stuff. So that's something else, too, where I feel like I've learned my business so well by, you know, driving the boat up on the rocks a couple of times and <laughs> surviving anyway and all that that I really, I've learned how to run my business by, you know, again, people who taught me and being a good observer and just learning that I could do that. Um, but the idea of coaches running their business, not just mm. being good coaches, I think that's something that often, I think coaches are challenged with. Because for example, a lot of coaches are intuitive and, you know, they're wired up with their EQ, but that doesn't mean mm. that they're good with numbers. Mm -hmm. or organization or tracking systems. And that's a challenge, I think, for a lot of coaches. And again, luckily, I had help so that I could do it. There are even, I've, I've talked to a number of them, coaches that specialize in in transitions like that, where you get you get to a point where you're really good at this thing that you do, whether it's you're a coach or whether you're like an engineer or you're a programmer or you're in, in, in and you're in, you're in some for your HR, you're in marketing, you're you know, whatever it happens to be. And you begin to move through your career development, whether that's starting your own business or moving up to a position of leadership in an already established business. And suddenly the skill set that you were executing on that you've gotten great at. I'm a fantastic coach. I'm an, I'm an excellent engineer. Um, and then you move into these positions that require different skill sets in order to be successful, like leadership, like how to operate a business from, from the numbers perspective, from the, you know, cash flow perspective, from the workflow perspective, from the managing of a team or managing multiple teams with different purposes that all serve the same business. Those skill sets require some development. And which is exactly where a coach is, is just so, so, so valuable. And it can be very difficult to understand that, you know, I've, I've gotten here through the skills I've developed over time. I'm, I've become an excellent coach. And now I'm also not only a coach, I'm also running a coaching business and realizing that that's a different like set of responsibilities and requires a different skill set. 
that's where, you know, you find a lot of coaches kind of struggling and stumbling and then eventually realizing I need a team. I need some help. I need the right help to kind of help me get along with this. I need to also kind of develop my alternative skill sets and get good enough at this so I can recognize the talent in a team member or in a team that I want to hire that I want to bring in that'll help my business continue to grow and let me continue to do the things that I love. Like, let me still be a coach who runs a coaching business, not someone who runs a coaching business that used to be, or sometimes is still a coach. Cause that's, it can take up so much of your time and your energy running the business itself that it becomes, it takes you away from what you want to do in the first place. And that's, it's such a tricky, tricky labyrinth to navigate. And finding the people who are going to educate you. I find that ICF yeah. often is a really great resource for other coaches who, yeah. you know, there are certain people, especially the people in the Los Angeles chapter where I'm a member, mm. um, there are people there who end up on the board who are really good at running their own businesses and so they can help run the chapter. Mm -hmm. And they're often very generous around mm -hmm. helping people think about systems or sharing, oh, this is the software I use or, oh, I have a great accountant or whatever it is. So again, that community of coaches often, mm -hmm. you know, look, by nature, we're helpers. We, we like to help each other too. <laughs> and that's a, that's been a great resource. I've been lucky that way. Yeah. That's, that's something I, I mean, ICF, like anybody who's been coaching or is thinking about coaching for very long, you, the ICF is the, is one of the first things you think of. And many coaches are members of the ICF in, in some standing. And there are plenty of them that aren't, or who are members of other coaching federations or coaching organizations. And I don't, at least here on this podcast, I don't know if I talk enough about that, the importance of that that community, that network of like-minded people who have who have lived and worked and sweated in the same areas that you have, or in, in just like, you know, like the Venn diagram barely overlaps, but you're still coaches. And the the way the the resources you have available when you are a member of something like the ICF, it's just, I mean, just just what you mentioned right there is invaluable to a coach who's struggling to navigate those early days or even that mid those middle days of developing their coaching business. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of what an organization like the ICF has to offer, I think. Well, listen, if I can do a little, I, I, it's not even self-promotion. I want to offer it up to other coaches, which is- Bring it on. <laughs> I have been leading for six years now a virtual special interest group about executive coaching. Ooh. And, and we meet six times a year and there's usually about 40 people on the call. And we get together for 90 minutes, six times a year. And it's self-led. We don't have mm. speakers come and talk to us. We talk to each other. And it's mm. been a wonderful community. And more than anything else, that's what it's been. People have found business partners there, but they've found mentors there. They've learned there. They've All kinds of things have happened in that group just mm. because of that idea of collaborative community and self-learning mm. and self-teaching. It's been great. It's been really great. I'm going to have to have you send me the link to that. If that's, if that's an open, if there are openings yeah. in that community, I'll make sure that gets into the show notes. Cause I, I know there are some executive coaches, plenty of them that listen to this podcast that might be interested in something like that. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, and in general, the Los Angeles chapter has become a global leader in offering tons of education. So teleclasses awesome. and special interest groups and my goodness. I mean, so if people are <laughs> looking for community and coach education, there's mm -hmm. all different kinds. So yeah, sure. I'm happy to send you the link. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, I like the rising tide, raising all boats. Let's get it out there now. <laughs> Absolutely. So, there was one thing that you, you teased me with. You, you were, you were going to tell me before I hit record that you wanted to like, you wanted to kind of either pick my brain on or see what I thought about it. And I'm And I told you to stop because I wanted you to surprise me. So I don't know what you're about to ask or what, what subject you're about to bring up, but I'm going to go ahead and prompt you now. What is that thing that you wanted to maybe talk with me about? Interestingly enough, it's about ICF. Really? <laughs> yes. So you got there get, anyway. <laughs> so get this. So I've been coaching more than 30 years. Mm -hmm. ICF is not 30 years old. When mm -hmm. I started coaching, ICF didn't exist. There was no certification process. And the group that I actually started coaching with, we were trying to figure out what corporate coaching actually was and how to get our corporate clients to understand it. So mm -hmm. we felt like groundbreakers. There were other people doing it at the same time, but it wasn't even called coaching in those days. It was, nope. <laughs> you know, would you work one-on-one -on -one with one of our leaders kind of thing. So I never did an ICF training. Also, ICF started, and it's focused mostly, most of the coaches, because I checked them out, most of them in those days were life coaches. 
So mm-hmm. I went in and they kind of, they were nice people, but they weren't my people. It wasn't my community. Yeah. And so I never got ICF certified. Hmm. But at a certain point, when ICF's profile here in Los Angeles had changed, I joined the organization. I've become a leader in the organization and I am not ICF certified. And here's hmm. the question that I have that I think is interesting. Hmm. And I talk about this with my ICF friends all the time, which is the way ICF trains their coaches and the fundamental belief that every client has the answer in him or herself, Mm -hmm. and that we as coaches are meant to be guides by the side, but we're not supposed to teach, we're not supposed to consult, we're not supposed to do training. Mm -hmm. I get that, but it doesn't work in executive coaching. Mm does not work in executive coaching in executive coaching i'm given first of all i'm given a bunch of money but i'm given a set of goals like take this Mm -hmm. person from point a and get them to point d in six months go Mm -hmm. and we're going to measure you and it's like if i i mean there's a part of me that goes if they could have figured it out on their own they probably would have these are smart men and women right at a pretty Mm -hmm. senior level they're going to need at some point they're going to need some consulting training models so they're going to need something that ICF would listen to that session and say, that is not good. Hmm. And so I think it's an interesting tension for executive hmm. coaches around how you get trained in ICF and what actually works with your clients to keep the corporate contract working. And I think it's an interesting problem. I do. I do. And I, I like I like your you are using the word tension to identify it because tension is not inherently good or bad. Tension is actually how a lot of things get done <laughs> sometimes. So I think identifying that it's tension and then talking about it and thinking about it and having discussions about it before assigning anything like good or bad or yes, it's coaching or no, it's not coaching. I think that's important because I think that's, that's a good a very, very good and very important area to explore as I'm thinking about it because, and this, I end up talking sort of in in adjacent areas on this subject quite a bit, um, especially with, in, with executive coaches, but with a lot of other coaches too, because there's, there tends to be a sort of hybridization or combination that a lot of coaches use where they have, they have like structures and blueprints and systems that they can run that will get you from point A to point B or C or D, depending on what your goals are, like, you know, exit planning strategy or, you know, just the business building systems. And it's through a coaching, a, in a, in a, within a coaching structure. And so there is, there's a provided structure that really is, it's a little, it's a little bit more than guidance. It's, it's sort of a roadmap. And it's hybridized with like with the coach being the guide on the journey and also providing the map, so to speak. I'm kind of like, you know, butchering this analogy here. And I encounter that quite a bit. And I think we are in an interesting time because of how coaching has exploded and is still evolving to where coaches do they do some consulting, most coaches do, or they occasionally like they they will insert something that's a little bit more tangible, especially especially in the corporate environment where where data analytics results driven, you know, very hard timelines are more the norm. They're more the status quo. And a coach has to serve those in the context of the work that they're doing for that organization while also maintaining their 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 intrinsic role as guide or guide on the side, which I like, I like that rhyme. And so I think, I think there is a very interesting tension there. In fact, that's something, yeah, like I said, it comes up without me thinking about it as a tension. I end up having conversations about it a lot through this podcast when I'm asking people, it's like, so how do you do what you do? And why do you do it the way that you do it? And, you know, sometimes it's pure guidance. It's pure, you know, guide on the side, um, which is still the heart, it's still the bread and butter, the meat and potatoes of coaching. Um, but there are plenty of coaches who have very specialized areas of work that they work in that they, they, they bring a system, they come with a blueprint and there's a, there's a timeline where it's like, we'll go from, we'll get you from here to there in 90 days or from here to there in half a year, whatever it happens to be. And it's, it's really about, which, which I, I think what I'm about to say is sort of representative of the heart of coaching, even as it might not be defined as coaching by someone like the ICF, there is a a commitment to helping people get from where they are to where they want to be and 
providing the energy and the guidance or whatever it takes really to help people in that journey. And I think that that service, that that desire to serve, to be of service is at the heart of every coach, even as some of their techniques might not be defined as coaching. I think that's, I th- that's, that's, that's where, that's what I'm able to say, what I'm able to think right now about that tension. I, this is a fascinating subject. I feel like I can, I can think on this for hours and days and, and obviously talk about it for even longer. <laughs> Well, and I, I'm going to guess that a lot of your coaches, you know, struggle with this in some way or another. One yeah. of the places where it shows up for me, my my podcast, The Look and Sound of Leadership, they're 20 minute episodes. And the first 10 minutes is a fictionalized coaching session hmm. where literally it's like a little radio play. She said this, I said this, she said this, I said this. And a lot of times coaches will reach out to me and go, oh, I've learned so much listening to you. And I think, oh my God, I hope not because... I would never coach like that because, you know, it's 10 minutes and it's got to be, you know, it's not, uh, it's not always great coaching. It's a good story and Mm -hmm. a nice little piece of drama, but there's a lesson in it and I'm trying to teach something to the listeners. And Mm -hmm. I think, I hope people aren't taking that as like a good coaching practice because there is so much teaching in Mm -hmm. it. And I do a lot less teaching now than I used to. I ask a lot more questions now than I used to. And that's the ICF influence on me. But mm-hmm. I still am aware. I just did it the other day with somebody where I said, look, I, I have to take off my coaching hat for a second. I'm going to put my consulting hat on. There's something mm-hmm. I think you would benefit from knowing. And she was like, oh, good. Teach me. And 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 she made me do it twice. She mm-hmm. was like, I really want to get this. This is fantastic. Hmm. And I was teaching and I just thought, you know, if some ICF auditor were listening to me, they would kick me out. Hmm. And I I just think it's all just fascinating. It really is. And it's like, it's, I'm of, I was going to say I'm of two minds about this, but it is still the same mind because on the one hand, I find that the rigor of defining what coaching is, I think it's, it's important to have a lot of attention and some eyes on that and to have some standardization. I think that really helps not just legitimize, but also grow coaching, not not only as a as a business, but also just as something that people are aware of that has value in their personal and professional development. And I get a little concerned when the uh, when the letter of the law begins to supersede the spirit of the law, so to speak. Yes, and yeah. I am aware that a lot of people who want to be helpers, like people who want to be therapists, often come with their own wounds. Mm-hmm. And if those wounds aren't addressed, and if you aren't trained how to keep your wounds out of the room, Mm -hmm. you often can hurt other people, although your intentions are good. And Mm -hmm. I have met those people at ICF where they're clearly very junior, and they cannot get out of their own way yet. Mm -hmm. And they're not quite ready to be coaches. And that's where I go, ICF training is fantastic, because they're going to help people with a bunch of tools that say, it's not about you. This is not about you and stay out of it. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of people, a lot of people who they were whatever they were in their prior life and they now want to be a coach. They need that training. And so Mm -hmm. I I think it's great. I want to be clear. I'm not bashing ICF. I think this is, yeah, I just think this is a really interesting problem for coaches to grapple with. Yeah, very much so. And it's, it's funny, as you were talking, I was thinking about how it's 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 almost like it's, it feels almost like an intrinsic struggle because your journey begins, or at least your coaching journey begins with, I want to help, and then you by learning how to coach, you learn how to remove the I, which it, that's far easier said than done. That's the work of a lifetime. <laughs> Quite frankly, agreed. Yes, agreed. But it does start with I want to help, and then you get help removing the I from the equation and being of service. It's it's oof, that's, this is a meaty meaty subject. I like this a lot because I, this this is something I don't get to talk about enough. This is I'm so I'm so glad I made you hold it in reserve because I was like, ooh, this is this is great. This is one of the this is one one of the core questions of coaching. I feel like as a as a as a as a as a model for 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 human development. Anyway, oh man, okay, I got to get you out of here. I just looked up at the Zoom clock because you you fascinated, you titillated my mind and my heart and my spirit. And now I'm looking at the time and I'm like. I lost track of you. So thank you for being on the show again. If, if, if it wasn't already certain, it's more than certain now I'm going to be having you back on again, <laughs> probably this <laughs> summer, because these kinds of conversations I feel like are a demonstration 
sort of like, you know, a, a, a just not, not quite to scale model of what coaching conversations could be like or exploratory conversations could be like. That's one thing I wanted to mention too, when you were talking about sometimes you go through those little 10 minute uh, quote unquote uh, fictional coaching sessions and how it's like, you have to be careful not to ever confuse the model for the journey itself or the map for the journey itself. The map is the map because it's meant to be small and it's meant to be a guide and you, have, you can have topography on it and you can, you can see on the map where the hill goes up and the hill goes down. That's not the path. That's the map. And so you have to rem- you never lose sight of that. I like, I like, I like thinking about that, but and that's maybe that's something we can talk about more and explore more next time. That's I'm just, I'm, I'm so like, I so don't want to let you go because I'm so enjoying this conversation, but before I let you go, which I'm going to do, I promise, where can people find out more about you? Where can people connect with you? Learn more about the podcast, learn more about your business, start a conversation. Where should I, where should I send people? <laughs> I run a company called Essential Communications, and our mm-hmm. website is essentialcom with two m's dot com. Easy peasy. I love it. I, show notes, obviously, um, and then also I'll I'll remind you. Don't forget to send me that link to that uh that executive coaching community meeting because I would love I would love to to help more people find that. <laughs> yes, I, and I would welcome them being there. So thanks, Tom. I'm just gonna say it one more time. Thank you. I'm I'm just I'm filled with gratitude and also lots of interesting thoughts. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to journal on and and think on for a while and talk about with with you again and with other coaches too. Now I'm gonna start bringing this up. <laughs> All right. Well, I look forward to it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. It's great to be with you again. And to the audience listening, I I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I certainly did. If you enjoyed it half as much as I did, then you're having a great day. So thank you for being here. Thank you for listening, and we will talk to you again very soon. <laughs>